Somebody didn't like what I was fixing to preach. Lars just didn't like it. He said, look, I'll, I'll delete it. I'll show you. Praise God. Um, while they're working, Matthew chapter 5. And uh, Marvin wanted me to tell you, Sunday school teachers, that you take the first few minutes of your class and you go over this material again with your students. Capiche? As my dad would say, sing neat goop. No Germans in here? Do what now? You have to what? Yeah, that's fine. All right. I just didn't know who went and who stayed and all that. So, All right. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about you are the salt of the earth. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to touch us, anoint us, guide us, and direct us. Let your hand continue to rest upon us. Quicken our minds and our spirits. Help us to receive with meekness the engrafted word. Help us, God, to be all that we can be for your kingdom. And let the seed be planted deep within us and let it bring forth fruit and we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Put your Bibles down one more time. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise because he is worthy of all of our praise. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Who taught on salt? Someone taught on salt. You did, Mandy? Was it you? Was it Bridget? You know? Bridget did? Oh, it was. You brought something up about salt, and I said that was good. What was that? You remember, Ramona? Yeah, we need to salt the crop of the enemy. I, that's, what I, that's what it was. Now, I don't have that in my notes, but I might bring that up again because I like what she said about it. I don't, I'm not, I don't think I've, um, I'm definitely not using your notes, sis. You can send them to me, and I'll combine them with what I got, and we'll, we'll have a good message probably if you take all mine out of there and use yours. All right. So what does salt do? First, it makes you thirsty. One moment. Then. Working on that. Look, Siri, I am not talking to you. I don't know why this thing keeps popping up. I already deleted it once and then it come back up again. <laughs> Lady, I'm not talking to you. I wonder where that voice was. It sounded like Vicky. It did. It sounded just like, I said, what is she saying? I thought you had a microphone. Oh, take the shoe off and slap the preacher upside the head. Jesus, help me, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. It enhances food. And then if you're old school, before Frigidaire, it was a preservative. Amen. I think they still cure ham. Don't they still cure ham with, with salt? Now, those of you that are super intelligent and super spiritual, I'm going to ask you a question. What 
meaning did Jesus have in mind when he said, you are the salt of the earth? Which one of them? No one's spiritual and no one's ancient. I don't have a clue either. But there had to be something there. So let me talk to you a little bit about this thing called salt. And uh, I know some of you are on a low salt diet because is it heart? Is it mess with your heart? Yeah, you got to know you got to still take salt because our body needs salt. So you got to watch that fine line of not enough and too much and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the thing about salt in dealing with us is that we have to be salty. You, I would call it highly potent. The second thing about salt is it has to make contact. I don't care how potent your salt is. If it's still in the shaker and not being used, it don't matter how potent you are. You could be all powerful potent. But if, you, if you're still left in the container and not making contact, I'm not talking about being close. I'm talking about making contact. Now, if, we've go, if we are going to be salt of the earth, both of them are a must. You got it? Look at your neighbor, tell him you got to be salty. But you also have to make contact. And if we're going to make any kind of impact in this city or in this world, we must be salty or highly potent, and we must make contact. Now, in building our relationships, remember relational evangelism, not just going out there and door knocking and all that, you know, all that's fine and good, and if you do that, then it's that's fine, whatever. But to be effective, remember from last week, is that we got to build these relationships. Now, if you study Jesus out, if you read through the Gospels, um, he spent a lot of time outside of the religious establishment with lost people. Right. We see him going to parties yeah. with publicans and sinners. The church got on him. Pretty hard about it. And then all you do is drink wine. It's called him a wine bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. Right. And then he quoted, I think it was Isaiah, one of them, about, hey, John came and he didn't eat or drink. And you say he has a devil. I come eating and drinking and you say I got a devil. Okay, I mean, you got it? So... Now, as we, as a church, we, we are very careful on building relationships with people outside of the, the body of Christ, okay? So we have these barriers, what I'm going to call barriers to building relationships, um, because of biblical issues. You know, Scripture teaches not to, and then, then it tells me you need to, and then, so what do I do? I'm not supposed to, but I need to. So uh, there's a difference between fellowshipping with believers and fellowshipping with the lost. Yeah. Right. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. There's, now, with these relationships that you're building with, with people that aren't in the kingdom, it's, 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 it's danger. It's he said, I'm going to send you out as sheep among the wolves. So, you know, you don't see a sheep running around with a pack of wolves. Right. If you do, they're inside their belly. Oh, yeah. Okay? So, so there's a danger here of doing this. I'm just kind of showing you some barriers of why we're, we're kind of reluctant even to go. 
and some, some things that you really need to pay attention to yourself uh, when you start doing this. You're going to risk your reputation. Because they might see you hanging out with a bunch of people and they got a bunch of alcohol at lunch or whatever, however, at dinner, and they're drinking wine and beer and drinks, and here you sit with your 7-Up and Coke or whatever, and they come by there, and what are they going to think? Oh, Marvin, yep, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew. So you're going to risk your reputation. And then you're going to feel uncomfortable around this kind of stuff. Okay, so the, so there's a, there's a lot here. So let me help you overcome some stuff tonight. You ready? Instead of going out with them, make them come to you. Invite them over. Let them come to your house. You, you set the atmosphere. Okay, instead of going over to their atmosphere, you bring them over to your atmosphere. It's okay, you'll find out. I, we've done it before, and you know, and they, we laughed and had a good time, played board game or whatever, and just kind of fellowship. What am I doing? I'm building that relationship. That's all I'm doing. He got, they got done, and they said, "Man, I can't believe we had this much fun and didn't even drink." Out of their mouth. Okay, you can involve other people in your everyday activities. Instead of going alone, why don't you invite somebody with you? And in the middle of all that, become that light, become that salt. Get close to them and invite. Don't, don't compromise who you are, and we'll get into this in a minute, but don't compromise who you are trying to reach somebody. Right. Uh, it, when I talk about being strategic with this, um, be strategic in your eating and your buying. Here, let me use a term, consumer strategy. You're, you're going to strategize. In other words, don't try to eat. I know some people, I'm going to eat at every restaurant known in Bossier and Shreveport. I want to eat at all of them. Just so I can say I did. I ate at every restaurant that Shreveport Bossier has. Instead of doing that, why don't you pick you out three or four of them, and that's where you go eat. And that way, now, when you walk in, they know your name because right. when we first moved down here into the South Bossier area, I ate, this is when I didn't care about what I weighed. I ate at Cafe USA quite, a, quite often. I would walk in there. They already knew what, they already knew my drink order. They, I mean, they just, hey, Ron, how you doing? And just... Boom, and they'd set it down, and, you know, what do you want today? And then I would order, and, you know. They, in other words, the relationship was built. The waitress was going to go to college, so I'd tip her real good, and I said, look, I'm paying for your college fund now, and joking with her and letting her know, you know. You, you follow what I'm saying? And, and you build that. You build that relationship, okay? And if, I, if you just keep going there, whether it be just getting a – cup of coffee or maybe a to-go drink. I don't know. Just stick your head in there. Do whatever. You know, but find you some place and just, and just build that relationship. Amen? Amen. It's, it's an intentional effort. You're, you're not just going to go. Don't just go there because they got good food. Of course you want to go there because they got good food. But you're going there with a strategy, with a mindset that, hey, I'm going to Somewhere I'm going to be able to open my mouth up and talk to the, either the server or the owner or, or whatever or have a moment where I can pray for the owner back in the back somewhere. However, however all that works, I, I want to pray a blessing on you. I want to pray a blessing on this business. I don't doubt if there's very few businessmen will go, you know what, I just don't want to be blessed. You know, you can let, God, let the Holy Ghost lead you, okay? So you frequent these places to get to know the people, and get to know who's working there. Who knows? You may run across somebody you know that's eating lunch there that you that you know. So you all with me? Yes. Why? Because those people matter to God. Yes. 
People matter to God. And they need help in finding a relationship with him. They, just like you need help building your relationship with God, they need help in building their relationship with God. Amen? Amen? Now, out of all this context here, be yourself. Because if I'm me, I don't have to worry about what mask I wore over here or over there or over here or over there. Just just be who you are. God wants to anoint you as an individual, your uniqueness. Y'all with me? Now, the function of this thing called salt, which Jesus said we are, is to permeate and affect everything that it touches. In other words, we influence the world. The world will be influenced through us. You didn't hear me. That's not a question. That's a statement. We will influence the world. It will be affected through us. They will feel God's power through us. They will feel God's presence through us. Now, talked a little bit about this last week. I want to bring it back up again. About your silent life. Your unspoken life. Look at Mark 9, 50. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Now, it's, it's obvious in natural characteristics that salt, that it, that it works silently and, and, and at contact. It, the, I can't stress enough about the contact. You can walk by them. You got to make a contact. You got to make a connect. Okay? You have to connect. It must make contact with other subjects to fulfill its function. So just walking around silently all the time is not the full answer, but you need to have a good silent walk. Amen? Amen. Now, if you don't have a good silent walk, then you ain't worth your salt. Where in the world did that come from? History tells us that the military was paid in salt. The Romans. That's where the term, they're thinking the term came from. You just ain't worth your salt. Because that's how you got paid. You got paid so much salt and boom, that y'all got it? Okay. So, if you don't have any saltiness about you, your silent life isn't effective. In other words, you're cussing, you're drinking, you're geegawking, you're glazing, you're doing whatever. You're laughing at all the jokes that are being told. Matter of fact, you're telling some of the jokes. You know, you're just, you're just part of the gang. You, you lost your savor. You've, you've lost your saltiness. And without that silent, steady, solid Christian walk, what you say means nothing. And just as effective as we need to be in communicating the gospel, we need to be effective in our silent witness. Y'all got it? Matter of fact, there are some times when a silent witness is preferred. And you just got to know. You ever tried to talk to somebody and said, no, I don't want to hear any of that? Well, shut up. Be quiet. Live it. Live it so good that they're going to ask you a question. And then when they ask you the question, get permission. Y'all with me? Folks, it often costs more to be silent than to be vocal. I got a Bible preface here. Remember Jesus during the trial? Pilate? Look at Matthew 27, 14. And he answered him to never a word insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. 
He just stood there, took it. Whatever they were saying against him, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't rebut. He didn't try to. He was just that silent. There's a time, Jesus is showing us, there's a time when you need to be quiet. That's right. But there's also a time when you need to speak. Amen. What we are is more important than what we say. Amen. Remember an old statement that we used to hear maybe when you were a kid? Do as I do. Or do as I say, not as I do. I've heard that a few times. Often, what we are shouts so loud that people can't hear what we say. You, you got it? This, this silent thing. If our lives do not evidence the savor of pure salt, then what we say has no value. If I'm going to talk about being a Christian to somebody, what are they thinking? They're thinking what a Christian is in their mind. They're thinking good, right, always right, never fails, never falls, never fumbles. And when I stumble in front of the lost, they're going to look at me and go, what? What's the use? I do that. I don't need what you got. You can't even live it right. So why, why, do, I, why do I need to even come to church? Instead of getting defensive and wanting to fight, well, I'm human just like you are. I make mistakes. I know, I know I've, we've all done our rebuttals on people. Oh, yeah. We're just trying to cover our tracks. See, if we live this thing right and we do it right in front of them, do Matthew 5 and Matthew 6 and Matthew 7. Do that for a week or two in front of people and see what happens. If you don't know what I'm saying, just... Read it. The greatest message ever preached on the face of the earth. It cannot be outdone. See, we got to, as a salted Christian, we have to make others thirsty for Jesus. And if they're not thirsty for Jesus, then we're not living it well enough in front of them. I, I've, I've told you this before. People will come up and kick you in the shin just to see what your response is. And if you respond like everybody else responds, kick them back, punch them, push them down. What does Jesus say to do? Now, watch this. Watch what Jesus tells us to do. We don't want to hear this. He tells you to turn the other shin. We don't teach our kids that, right? We're going to teach our kids. No, you defend yourself. Well, that's not Matthew 5, 6, and 7 at all. That is not turning the other cheek. And I, oh, I've got your rebuttal now. Well, what if he hit the other cheek? It doesn't say nothing after that. <laughs> yes, it does. Run. I mean, I don't, I mean, it's, it would be cool to be a, you know, an eighth grader and, and you beat up somebody. It'd be cool. And then you're walking around. Yeah, I beat him up. Yeah, and you're acting all bad. How many people did Jesus beat up? The way I looked at it, they were fixing to stone him, chuck him off the cliff in his own hometown. And the Bible says, and he walked through them. Now, I, now to walk through a crowd that's fixing to kill you, he probably didn't have a really good smile on his face. He probably, yeah, touch me and see what happened. You know, he probably had that look about him for him to be able to walk through the crowd. Now, I believe that we need to defend ourselves, but not at the first. What are the, what's the old, not, not the Bruce Champion way. If you see him run after him and fight him, that's not, that, that is opposite of Christianity. He knows that now, but he didn't know it then. Dad said, so that's what we do. Then we go home and we brag about, hey, I saw Joe and I took after him and he ran like a little scared chicken. I just want to make somebody thirsty. And we can do it just by living it. 
Now, move on to the next side of this thing about salt. And, and salt is, you gotta, you got to be able to speak. It's not enough just to walk around with a pretty salt shaker. That, that every once in a while, needs to be turned over and shook on somebody. Okay, look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So if they're asking a question, I'm living it in such a way that what are they doing? Now they're asking questions. What is it about you? What are you? What, what is this? See, we live it in such a way that they ask questions. Oh, that person you're having a problem with at work? Here, let me quote it this way. Your enemy? Why don't you bring him a glass of water? Buy him a Coke? Mess with him? Bring him some biscuits in the morning? Hey, I was coming to work, thought about you. It was right here at Wendy's. Here's a, here's a cheese biscuit. Mess with them. What you're saying, you're not going to get to me. Jesus, that's Jesus. That's the Jesus way. Right. Just, that's how you overcome evil, with good. Instead of, man, I hate... You come home and all you're doing is... You're driving down the road... Well, there's a way to overcome that. Not by going home and, and moaning and groaning all the time. You overcome evil with good. The greatest need in the church at the present time is for every member evangelism. This isn't, don't think, well, that's just for the crew that does the, goes out and hangs the door hangers or doing whatever. It's not that. No, everybody, look at your neighbor. You are an evangelist. Now look at them. Tell them, you are called of God to be a soul winner. God has already called you. You don't have to go to the prayer room and say, God, do you want me to win a soul? Right. Amen. This is, you don't have to spend any time in fasting or prayer or any, nothing to figure this one out. You are called of God to be a soul winner. Without this concept that every member evangelism will never evangelize the world at all. If we don't have this concept, the evangelism rests on my shoulders, rests on your shoulders, rests on our shoulders. Not just groups of, that go. No, individually, I am called. As I am going, as people come to the house. You ever had anything break down? Did you have anybody come and repair whatever broke down? Did you witness to them? They're not going nowhere. They're trying to fix your stuff. Open your mouth up and talk to them. It don't matter if they're not even from this area. Open your mouth up and plant the seed. Just, that's, and if you get in the habit of planting the seed everywhere you go, it, it, it becomes this second nature for you to wait for that opportunity to be able to plant the seed. Right. Amen. Amen? See, we think, well, we'll, have, we'll bring in a revival guy, and, he, and he'll come, and we'll have revival. If that worked, then we'd be having revival, because I brought him in by the droves, and here we are. Right. Amen. Well, we'll just get on the radio. We'll do a crusade. We'll, 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 we'll rent the Coliseum. If that worked, then churches would be full and coliseums would be full. We'll get on TV. That'll, that'll do it. No, if that worked, then it just, it's not the answer. It's not going to accomplish the task that God wanted. God's supreme method is that we should be talking Christians. You need to open your mouth everywhere you go in a loving, Christ-like way and do a simple invitation, do a simple prayer, you might be surprised what God will do with somebody if you just open your mouth up and say, hey, would you mind if I prayed for you? God just might do it. He's not going to do the miracle here. He'll do it out there. He... We need a salted witness operating as the early church did. They were salty. Think about it. After the uh, persecution of Stephen, 
the uh, disciples in Acts 8 and 4, they were, therefore, they that were scattered abroad, where'd they do? They went everywhere, and what were they doing? What were they doing everywhere? Preaching the word. Everywhere we go, we need to preach the word. You don't have to be a preacher to preach, but you got to open your mouth up. you got to learn to effectively communicate the gospel message to people. Yeah, they're out there. They don't even love themselves. They, they don't, they don't, if they don't love themselves, they know God can't love me. They don't, they don't know God. They just think God doesn't love me because that's why I'm like I am right now. They need to hear just a simple word that Jesus loves you. Now, I know you're not going to raise your hand, but I could call you out. How many people gossip? Oh, it's not just the ladies. Well, let me give you a term. Gossiping the gospel. Those of you that like to gossip, like to talk about folks, why don't you talk about Jesus? Hey, did you hear what Jesus did? No, I didn't. What did he do? Well, you'll talk about Sally and Sue and Jim and John. Man, did you hear about John? Whew, you wouldn't believe what happened to John. No, what, what happened? Now, I'm not gossiping or nothing. You've got to preface this, you know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gossiping. Or, oh, yes, you are. See, when they started gossiping the gospel, in a little over 30 years, they, that known world, they flipped it upside down. They didn't have a radio station. They did not have a TV. All they had was word of mouth. Folks, we can do this. They didn't have billboards. They didn't have any of that. We can do this. Amen. We just got to be attentive. We just got to be knowledge. We just got to, you got to want to. Yes. What we need are salt and people that know how to season with salt. Yes. Amen. You ever put too much salt on something? Yes. Don't look in the gar. Oh, man, hopefully you dumped it. I cooked a meatloaf yesterday. Donna was working, so. I had two small onions. Two pounds of deer meat, one pound of deer meat, and one pound of hamburger meat. Sausage deer meat, by the way. So, I, well, we need, one isn't going to be enough, so I put two in there. I don't know, they were a little bitty. They're not big enough. So I got to mixing that stuff. I put the eggs in and the, you know, all the stuff you do and all the, and I got to looking at that and I said, it ended up being more onion than. So Marvin, I take this ball of meat. Started shaking all the onions started. I threw it in the garbage. Needed it again. Shook that onion fell off. I finally got it down to where I felt like, okay, I can work with this. As you would say, oops. Well, we, we can do that with salt, too. You can just put, two, it's awful salty. You know, you know, you didn't. There's, I don't know, maybe they say, what can you do? Put sugar in there or something? I don't know, something. Maybe let's see, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's anything that can fix something that's too salty other than just pouring more of whatever you got, more broth in there or whatever, okay? So, so here's the thing about it. Typically, we as Christians don't shake our shakers very often, and when we start shaking our shakers, we, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. You turn into the spiritual Elvis. A hunk of hunk of burning love. And you shake, and you just get, Bruce, you know that's right. You shake, and you just keep shaking. 
But there's a whole lot of shaking going on. And you won't stop shaking. You shake so much that you start physically shaking. Because you hadn't shook your shaker in a while. In other words, you don't know how to control the anointing when it comes on you. Because you don't use it enough to learn to control. A lot of young preachers, you can see when the anointing comes out, they don't know what to do. Sometimes they just don't know what to do, so they don't. What's that? Well, that's the anointing. Use it. It's your helper. You'll hear a preacher, well, I feel my helper now. And it was telling me he felt the anointing come on him. All right. Y'all still with me? So typically when we don't witness and we get the opportunity to witness, we, we shake too much. and We put too much on them. And we end up doing what Sister Ramona talked about. We end up killing it. And we don't want to do that. We're here to do what? To make thirst. So just because I have a whole salt shaker doesn't mean I use all the salt at one time. I just need to put out enough to try to get them thirsting. Y'all with me? Now, what if the salt loses its savor, it, 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 the failure of the salt? The salt doesn't work anymore. There, now, there, there are two ways that salt can lose its flavor. First thing is, is isolation. You keep that salt and you have old, 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 old salt, it's probably not any good. It'll, it'll, lose, it'll lose its power, its potency. And if you take just one grain of salt and you leave it by itself and it doesn't have anything to... Definitely. So this thing called isolate. Look at Mark 9.50. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith shall, it, shall you season it? Then he says, have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Now, I wanna, want you to look at the latter part of that verse there. Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Now, the opposite of that is isolation. Notice that he said, if you want to maintain your saltiness, you've got to be around others, one another. If you just go off and you isolate and you don't get around anybody, you, you're going to lose your witness. You're going to lose your effectiveness. Salt, which is isolated over a long period of time, is said to lose its strength. The, the person who isolates himself from church or Christian fellowship and, and the means of grace eventually loses its keenness or its zeal. You're going to lose your effectiveness because you don't know how to interact with people. Right. You don't know how to interact. And so you're going to lose your zeal. God has called us to a life of separation. We are a separate people, but certainly not to a life of isolation. I'm separated from this world, but I'm not isolated. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. Amen. See, togetherness and fellowship is the key to maintaining a good, strong saltiness. Because iron does what to iron? It sharpens iron. We sharpen one another. Okay? You, might, you may not know, and then someone may bring it up that you are, and you go, wow, I never didn't realize I was. I need to correct that. What happened? I just got sharpened. Amen? Amen. See, watch what they did in Acts 2.42. They con what did they do? They continued steadfastly. How? In the apostles' doctrine. Listen, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. These, these, these are essentials if we're going to maintain the saltiness. What made that church so effective is that they continued in the doctrine. They didn't stop. They learned as much as they could about the doctrine. Why we do what we do. Ask questions about this place. Why do we do that? Why do I look like this? Why do I act like this? Ask questions. Don't just do it to do it. You want to do it because you know to do it. And it's a biblical based in what you're doing. Amen. Amen. Continue in. Continue in fellowship. That's why we, we were fellowshipping. I don't know what happened to our fellowshipping, but fellowship. Put it back on the, we need it on the table again. We need to be fellowship, whether it's going bowling or whether it's doing this or whether it's doing that. We got, it, it's what helps us. It helps us. It helps me. Amen. Amen. Break the bread. Open that word up. Talk. 
Fellowship with one another. Hey, come over to eat. Do this. Come fellowship. Y'all with me? Have prayer meetings. What's that? It's when you talk to God with the people around you. Look at what the uh, Hebrew writer said in, in Hebrews 10.25. You know this. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Does anybody see the day approaching? We see it. We know it's coming. We know it's close. Right. We've never had it this close before. But when we get to see, and he said, when you see the fig leaf bud start budding, you know that it's the time is near. We're seeing the, man, we don't see him budding. We're seeing full, full blaze, you know. We're, we're seeing the full thing. And he said, as you approach that hour, he said, you need to exhort one another. You need to encourage. If you see someone missing tonight, that normally call them. Hey, we missed you tonight. Right. Amen. And then listen to their excuse and say, come on, we can do better prioritize, help them. Now, another way salt can lose its flavor is infiltration. Go back to our text. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Now, that verb lost is lost its Favor, flavor, lost his flavor, is from the Greek word moros, which means dull or sluggish or stupid or foolish. Now, if we allow the world, the flesh and the devil to infiltrate our lives, we will become tasteless and bland. You wonder why people aren't listening to you? You've got too much world. You've got too much junk food. What do you tell your children, you know, it's three, 4 o'clock, you're fixing to eat at 5.30, it's 4 o'clock, and the kid comes up and says, I'm hungry. Can I eat some Cheetos? Can I have a Snicker bar? Now, some of you may say, I don't care. Eat what you want to eat. A good parent would say, no, we're fixing to eat supper here. Why? Why am I making that child go without because when we get to the point when it's dinner time, they're going to be so full of junk food that they don't want to eat the good food. And that's what happens with Christianity a lot. You come, people come in, they're so full of junk food, and you know what, you know what they'll tell you? I'm just not being fed. How do, how do I feed somebody that's so full of junk food? I mean, you're watching this and doing this and watching that and watching this and watching that and watching this and watching that and watching this and watching that and, and there's no God at all. You didn't pray. You didn't fast. You didn't worship. You, didn't, you barely come here. You sit on, thick like a lump on the log, and then you just look around thinking, you better thank God I'm here. Too, too much junk food. Hungry people, when we come, we're hungry. Amen. Right? That's why we do what we do because we're Hungry. You need to come to church hungry. See, when I allow this impurity of the world to infiltrate my spiritual life, I lose my power. I lose my zest. I lose my zeal. I become sluggish. Have you ever seen a hungry person sluggish? Usually, what are they doing? They're trying to, they're hunting work. Why, you, why do you want to work? Because I'm hungry. I got to feed my kids. I got to feed my family. I got to feed myself. Amen. The Apostle Paul carried a wholesome fear to his dying day, lest having preached to others, he said, that I myself should be a castaway. He said, It's possible to be a preacher and, and win the world and lose. That's scary. We need to pack that kind of fear with us. Amen. I don't want to ever lose my savor. I don't want to ever lose my usefulness, the, the usefulness of salt. Because if, it, if I lose my saltiness because I let so much stuff, junk, get in the way that I lose my effectiveness, then, then you might as well cast me on the dirt and trample me underfoot. Y'all still there? Let me close with this kind of stuff. Think of Lot's wife. 
She had been delivered from Sodom and Gomorrah. We're talking about a wicked city. God delivered her, hand-led her out of there, delivered that woman out of there, but she refused to go all the way with God and turned into a monument of usefulness and shame. The Bible said she turned into what? See what can happen to us when we let too much of that. Does anybody like water and salt? What is it? What happens if I get a little bit of water on that salt? What does it do? It gets all what? It's crusty. You ever seen? You, you buy the salt containers, the big one, Morton. What is it? Is it Morton? I don't know. The blue one with the little flip-up thing. You ever ever shook it and then it'd be? Kum, 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 kum. Yeah, I got moisture in there. Humidity. It's Louisiana. So what do you do? I, sh- I shake it. I'm breaking that thing up, okay? Because I want to be able to pour that, pour that salt out. See, sometimes we got too much world in us, and we get clumps of salt in us, and it's just not any good. It, you can't. And then when you're on somebody, who wants a clump of salt? Put that on my steak. You know, no. Think about Samson, who having promised with Though having promised the world, he lost his strength and sight of service. He compromised. Simple. Dead lion. Killed it. Comes back. Honey's coming out of the carcass. Oh, Samson, no, no, no. You can't do that. That's unclean. What did he start doing? He compromised. God Did God shut him down? Not yet. But he just kept compromising. Man, I don't want, I don't want our women. I want, I want one of them women. And then it even said it was of the Lord. Right. See, if, if Samson would have been salty... That opportunity never would have arose. God would have found another way, but he knew the weakness of Samson. Hey, if that's, this is the way Samson's going. God will, show, God will still, listen to me, listen. God will still use us even when we're not 100% salty. He's going to use what he can use. So what do you mean? He ha What about Ananias and Sapphira? Holding back part of the price that uh, lost not only the money they retained, but they lost their lives as well. Right. See, these, these people, these, these three stories, if you would, I don't, I'm not going to get into time of breaking them down, but these, these people compromised. They, 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 they let a little bit get in, and then they let a little bit more get in because God didn't crush you the first time. You think, well, it must be okay tell you something about this walk balance you're going to go through seasons we all go through seasons there's going to time you're going to wake up and you're going to go Jesus and Moses Elijah the burning bush and all of the encamped angels are around about you and it's all visible and all you had all you said was Jesus and all that showed up then there's other times you can pray until you're purple green orange and blue and nothing you fast, you do, you do everything you know to do, you come to church, you worship like a maniac and nothing. It's a season. When you understand this is seasonal, but just because I, it may not be raining on me right now doesn't mean I quit. Just because you didn't feel the Holy Ghost doesn't mean I quit witnessing. I, I This is a walk of faith. So there's times when I got to walk by faith. Amen. Y'all with me? So even in the dry times, when the Holy Ghost is raining, praise God, I like that. I like mountaintops and rain and all that good stuff. But then you get in that valley and there's no water down in that valley and it's just a, a desert. Nothing's growing down there and, and God tells you to go into that valley, go into that wilderness. 
And you get out in the middle of the wilderness, and guess who meets you? The devil's there. And what's he doing? He's tempting you. Just like he did Jesus. Spirit led him out there. But when he came back out of that place, he wasn't being led by the Holy just being led by the Holy Ghost. He came back with power. And that's what God wants us. He's given us. Watch that Acts 1 8 thing. That is the last words of Jesus. He said, I'm going to give you power. And it's going to be power to witness. So you can't tell me if you got the Holy Ghost, you don't that you you've got the power to do this. You're just choosing not to. You've, you've developed, I've, I've allowed you to develop a bad habit of not witnessing. And so I'm, I'm willing to take these weeks out here. I don't care how long it is until we start getting enough visitors where I feel like we're having enough visitors. You're going to hear me on Wednesday nights some way or another. And even on Sunday morning, Sunday night, you know, somehow we got to get in the soul winning business. It's who we are. It's what we are. It's the, why are you here? We're here to win a soul. Amen. We're here to win a lost and dying world. That's why you're giving your money. It's not just to keep the air on, not to keep the lights on. All that's fine and good. And thank God we have it. Amen? Amen. But it's for us to be able to reach somebody. And we've got the message, folks. we got a beautiful message. The plan of salvation is awesome. So go through. Pull out that Bible study. If you went through the, the class of... Um, Sister Kathleen or even Brother Bruce's class, they taught you that Bible study. Remember the Bible study? Pull it out. Teach it. Study it out. Teach it to your wife. Teach it to your kids. Teach it. Then go out there and start teaching it to somebody else. Simple. Very few scriptures, but folks, it's powerful if you'll use it. This message will work if we use it. So live it to the best of your ability. Do the best you can. Those, that, that, that wicked, evil person that you're battling against, bless it. Y'all with me? You want to be a light? I do. You want to be salt? I do. I want to end up on the right side of this thing. So let's stand. Let's come forward. lift our hands right now. Father, in the name of Jesus. Yes, Father. You are the light of the world. Yes, you are, Lord. And you're the king of all kings. Now, God, we're standing here just in this quiet little peaceful time of teaching God that asking you to help us to become the salt that we need to be. Yes, Lord. Help me to learn how to use my salt shaker right. Not too much. It's enough to create a thirst. Help us, God, to be a silent witness and then help us, God, to be a spoken witness. Quicken us, our minds, our spirits. Help us, Lord, to be all that we can be for you and your kingdom. Let us learn to communicate this gospel message. Help us, Lord. Touch us, God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, hasten your word and perform it, God. In Jesus' name, amen. One more thing. And I've heard this come out of the mouth of people before. Well, I know you're a preacher and you don't watch this. Why are you watching it? Because you're a preacher. We're all preachers. I don't live this any harder than any of you. So don't go throwing that stuff. I know you didn't watch this. Well, why are you watching it? Why are you looking at that? There are ways you can watch stuff and get all that junk out of there. You just got to be willing. If you're going to pay the price, pay the price. Amen. Amen. Don't be listening. 
Maybe I need to do something on music. There, there is no worldly music that is wholesome. I don't care if it is muskrat love. Some of you know what I'm saying. Some of you may not. That's all right. That's 70 music. By a group called Bread. Now, and some of you are going to go, my scrat love, Bread. And you'll listen to it. It's just easy listening. Just, you know, oh, I'll play this for my wife and I. No, you don't. If it takes muskrat love to get you there, you, you, need, you need help. You got issues. Hello? You got it? Well, I, I, listen, to, I listen to that jazz. There's not a, if, it, if it says anything, any word in that music you're listening to, eh. I like jazz, by the way. But if, if, they, if they put, sometimes they can put some jazz on there. If they're not singing, I'm cool with it. I'll listen to that music. A lot. I like it. I just like the, I like the sound of it. I like the way they play. But as soon as they start singing, I don't need you. See, I'm opening up. See, I'm, I'm keeping this spirit, that music. Remember we talking about this. That music opens your spirit up. Music opens your spirit up. And there's some things I don't want to be opened up to. But I'm going to open up. I want to hear some. Not he picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille. Hello? So all that stuff, I know you young folks, I know I'm just like all foreign and terrible and bad. But mama, be a bear when it comes to that. Oh, they're sneaky. They are sneaky. I, there's one back there. She was so sneaky. She, she t- we used to burn CD. They'd burn them CD. Have two or three good Christian songs, and then I had to listen to the whole thing just to be able to pick out. And then she'd tell me, "I love you, Jesus." That that's Christian music. I don't think so. Man, if that doesn't make you lift a hand in total surrender to God, then you don't need to be listening to that stuff. (laughs) Except for Stevis Curtis Chapman in the cartoon song. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you gotta you gotta at least listen to it, don't you? That was Madison I's that's our theme song. (laughs) They were praising Jesus in there, weren't they? Turn it up, Papa. Turn it up. We, that thing would be blasting so loud. I love you. Be salt. Live it. Amen. If you fall, get back up. Live it. Don't fall again. Learn from it. Amen? I love you. You know that, right? Yes. Bring somebody to church. Invite, invite, invite. If, that is a style of evangelism. Some people are really good at that. So if you're really good at invitations, grab you some cards, invite. If you're not really good at invitations, grab you some cards and invite. Amen. Open your mouth up and talk. And you could just say, you know what? Jesus loves you. And that might bring tears. You don't know what those words can do to somebody. Amen. Amen. I love y'all. Bless you.